Well, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning I've already read the text. It was the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, and since I'm going to read it again in the sermon, I won't read it again now. So let's just go ahead and start first by reflecting on what it was we were looking at last week. Remember last week we started looking at uh, Calvin, John Calvin, and we reflected first of all on how both he and Luther had something in common, and that is they used all their gifts and all their energies, they put all their efforts into promoting the work of God's kingdom in the world, which in those days was essentially Europe. Uh, they gave their all. And in this, they were simply doing what it is that our Lord calls all of us to do, and that is to love Him with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. Again, we need to be reminded, if we, are to, if we are really to have any hope of seeing any change in our world for the glory of Christ and His kingdom, it's not going to happen unless we devote ourselves to Him in the same way. We don't have the same gifts, we don't have the same calling, but we do have gifts, and the Lord has placed us in various circumstances where we are to use those gifts to try to reach out to others with Christ, with His gospel. Now, this evening, we're going to look at some other uh, developments in Calvin's life. We're going to see how the G G excuse me, Geneva City Council called on Calvin, first of all, to answer a letter by Cardinal Satellito, who basically in Calvin's absence uh, wrote to Geneva to try to bring them back into the Church of Rome. They did not believe that they could answer his letter and didn't know anyone except Calvin who could. And so this ultimately results in Calvin's return to Geneva. Uh, we'll see secondly at how Calvin and the council dealt with Michael Servetus, uh, the notorious heretic and outlaw who came to Geneva, even though he was warned not to come, uh, to make trouble for Calvin and what happened to him and why. And then we're also going to begin looking at Calvin's theology. You know, when we think of Calvinism, I mean, what is it you think of when you think of Calvinism? I, I bet you uh, I can guess. Yes, that's right. The five points, okay? Uh, but that was actually something that developed later, after Calvin's lifetime, really. At the Synod of Dort, these are basically five Calvinist answers to five Arminian objections, the, what are called remonstrants, that um, the, the, the group that brought them were called the remonstrants, and they were looking for toleration of this teaching in the church, but the Synod of Dort said, no, we, we don't believe these things, this is what we believe. But we, we need to understand Calvin never summarized his theology, certainly not in five points. It was much more than, than that. Um, Godfrey is going to tell us that uh, Calvin worked very hard to be biblically balanced. He didn't want to emphasize one teaching over any other unless he saw that teaching emphasized in the Bible. But um, still, efforts were made to find Calvin's focus. And B.B. Warfield, professor of theology at Princeton Seminary from 1887 to 1921, while Princeton, by the way, was still a, a very conservative uh, seminary, believed that he found Calvin's focus in the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. Now, many had discussed the Father's sovereignty and His electing work before Calvin. Many also, the, the two natures of Christ and His atoning work. I mean, just think of Anselm's Cur Deus Homo. But it was Calvin who first analyzed more profoundly how these things, the Father's, again, choosing the Son's work, are applied to us by the Holy Spirit. So much so, I mean, Cal uh, Warfield saw so much of this emphasis in Calvin that he nicknamed him the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we continue uh, the Reformation series today, I, I want us to focus on the Holy Spirit and how the Lord is working the devotion that we saw in Luther and Calvin in us through the ordinary work of His Holy Spirit, which makes this, of course, very, very important. Now, this morning, I want us to consider, again, who the Spirit is, because we often lose sight of Him. 
And secondly, his role in God's plan of salvation. Now, next week, we want to consider, you know, I mean, we, we want to consider as we think about his role, we want to consider this morning how he illumines the Scriptures and draws us to the Word of God to transform us. But next week, I want us to see how that ongoing work is what assures us that we belong to the Lord. And by the way, if we don't know that, we're never going to be able to throw ourselves into the work in, in the way the Lord would have us to do. We have to settle that question. Now, first of all, let's consider who the Spirit is. And, and I want to do that because sometimes I think we focus so much on the Son, and, and there's certainly nothing wrong with that. We focus so much on Jesus that we tend to neglect, really, the Father and the Son. We tend to forget that they even sometimes exist. And if we manage to remember the Father and the Son, it seems like we end up neglecting the Holy Spirit. I think charismatic churches have the opposite problem, where they focus so much on the Holy Spirit that you begin to wonder whether there is a Father and a Son. Or we don't have that problem. We have the problem of the focus on the Spirit. Now, maybe that's because His particular work in the plan of redemption is to draw our attention to the Son. Okay? And Jesus says, when He comes, He will glorify Me, so that He, that is the Son, might draw attention to or give glory to the Father. So maybe it's because of His work that we don't think so much about Him, because He wants to draw our attention to Jesus and Jesus to the Father, but it might also be because of his name, okay? His name, the Holy Spirit, which almost seems to imply that he is something other than a person. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth, but I think you understand there are cults out there who deny the personality of the Holy Spirit, such as Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, God tells us in his word, and we need to be firmly convinced that the Spirit, of course, is a person. He, he does things that only a person could do. He issues commands to the church. Remember what Luke writes in Acts 13, too. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, that should really settle the question once and for all. I mean, because no impersonal force could use pronouns such as me and I and issue commands, would have a will. Well, the Spirit of God also leads. He's the one who is leading us. Paul writes in Galatians 5.18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. By the way, that is the key to knowing that we really belong to the Lord, that the Spirit is leading us in the ways of the Lord, and we follow Him. Uh, he can be lied to. Peter said to Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? You can't lie to an impersonal force. He can be grieved. Paul writes, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, what is it that grieves the Holy Spirit? It's when we resist doing what he tells us to do in his word when we sin against the Lord, okay? Well, he's grieved by that because, well, apparently the Spirit of God has affections and he loves what is right. And when we don't do what is right, he's grieved. And obviously he can also be sinned against. Jesus said to the Pharisees who saw his miracles and knew that Jesus was the Messiah sent from God and that he was doing these things by the Holy Spirit, they said to him, you do these things by the prince of demons by Beelzebul. And Jesus said to them, whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. So again, the Spirit of God leads, he guides, he commands, he, he, uh, he can be, you know, um, sinned against, and uh, he can uh, also, of course, lead and direct us, he can be grieved. These things are not true of something impersonal. The Bible tells us he's a person, but he also, the Bible also tells us that he is more than just a person. He is a divine person. When Ananias lied to the Holy Spirit, Peter said to him, you have not lied to men, but to God. 
And then we understand that he is the third person of the triune God. When Jesus told his disciples to disciple the nations, he said to them they should baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Notice one name, three persons, all of whom the name applies to. The name is Yahweh, the Lord. And certainly you would not want to put any other name in this list because you realize that would be blasphemy. What Jesus is telling us here is that all three persons are this one God and they are all to be worshipped. The Westminster Assembly writes in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 21, verse 2, religious worship is to be given to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to Him alone. By the way, that is why we are gathered here this morning, not just to hear a sermon, we are gathered here this morning to worship the Trinity. So that's the point I wanted to make, first of all. Realize who the Spirit of God is. Secondly, being a member of the divine Godhead, understand what His particular work is, what His specific role is in the, the plan of redemption. Now, being a member of the Trinity, we understand all the persons are equal, okay? There's no subordination in the Godhead. But when it comes to the work of salvation, each of them has a particular role, and we must not allow that to lead us astray and to make us think that somehow because the Spirit is sent by the Father and the Son, or the, Father, or the, the, the Son is sent by the Father, and that He obeys His Father, that there is subordination. There is in their work, but there isn't in their person, who they are in the Godhead. Now, what are their roles? Well, the Father knowing, that though He made man upright, that man would disobey and bring Himself and all of His children, except for the Lord Jesus Christ, under the curse of the covenant of works, that in Adam all would die, all would be condemned to hell, he chose whom He would save, and He sent the Son to save them, to save us. The Son, when it was the right time, came and did the work necessary to save us. And the Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son in His time to apply what the Son did to us. Now, this was Calvin's focus, the Spirit of God applying what the Son did to us or for us. Now, Jonathan Edwards agreed with this, but he also thought that this doesn't really give the Spirit the honor that, that he deserves. And so he suggested another way that we can look at this, and I think this was good. The Father is the one who gave the price for our redemption. Jesus says in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The Son came into the world to pay the price for our redemption. Peter writes, You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. But here's the important thing. Oh, the others are important as well. But this is the thing I want us to see. The Spirit, Edward says, is what was purchased Okay? If we think of the Spirit simply as applying what Jesus did, it seems like the Father made the sacrifice by giving His Son. Jesus made the sacrifice by laying down His life, but the Spirit just simply gives that to us, something that somebody else did. But what Edwards is saying here is that the Spirit is the one that the Father sent the Son to purchase, that Jesus actually did purchase, and that the Lord is now able to give to us he is the one who makes all the difference now in our lives, and it would not be possible apart from what the Father and Son did. We lost the Spirit at the fall. When Adam sinned, he lost the Spirit of God, not just for himself, but for all of us. And with the loss of the Holy Spirit, we lost the ability to love and devote ourselves to God as He calls us to, as is right, as really we are uh, obligated to do by virtue of the fact that He created us and He redeemed us. He restores this in us. Now, it's this work of the Spirit that is central to Calvin's thinking 
and what we need to understand today. Godfrey is going to point out tonight that if Calvin were alive today and he looked at today's church, he would wonder why so many people are so interested and are emphasizing so much the extraordinary work of the Spirit, okay? The miracles, the tongues, foretelling the future, the gift of knowledge. If you haven't been in those circles, they do exist. A lot of charismatic churches, and, and that is the focus of a lot of them, not all of them, but of a lot of them. But so few seem to focus on His ordinary work. You know, there's so much abuse of this extraordinary work of the Spirit in churches that tends to make even those non-charismatic churches avoid the subject. Uh, they don't talk about the Spirit at all. But we need to think about that work. You know, the Puritans wrote more on the Spirit, so did John Calvin, than anybody else, essentially, because they understood the importance of this work. Now listen again to what Paul writes in our passage in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. By the way, that's an offensive noise. You know, it doesn't please God. It's offensive to Him. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Notice the greatest gifts and the greatest sacrifices can be made without being saved. But without this salvation, without this love to motivate them, these things mean nothing to God. As a matter of fact, they're only offensive. So it's this love that is precious, this love that makes the exercise of the extraordinary gifts valuable to God. Without this love, nothing we do can please God. I mean, just think about Judas. We don't often think about this. We think of Judas as the one Jesus singles out, the one who's going to betray him, the one who's a devil from the beginning. But you realize that Judas, when Jesus sent out the 12 to go preach, and to go perform miracles, and to cast out demons, and to raise the dead, that Judas was among them, and he was doing those things as well as the others, and yet he was rejected by the Lord Jesus Christ because he didn't love God. He didn't have that change of heart by the Holy Spirit. He wasn't saved. He wasn't one of the elect. God never gave him this grace. Now, the Spirit is the one who gives us this love. He is the one who is this love. You know, think about that. Think about how much more personally the Spirit of God is involved in our lives. He doesn't just change our hearts and then just sort of, you know, live outside of us. He actually enters our souls and He unites Himself, himself to our souls and He becomes in us an active principle which is likened in Scripture to a fire that we would be zealous for good works. So when He comes to us in the new birth, that is His ordinary work. And what He does is He kindles a fire of affection in our hearts. He is that fire of affection. He is the one within who is leading us to do what we should do. Now finally, I want us to begin to consider how the Spirit of God, you know, what He does to create this devotion within us. It is this affection, yes, but it's an affection for certain things. Now, first of all, he begins by convincing us that the Bible is the Word of God. Okay, we're never going to trust Jesus unless we believe what the Bible says. We're never going to do what God calls us to do unless we know He calls us to do it. And to do that, we need to believe the Bible is the Word of God. So what the Spirit of God does at regeneration is He illumines our minds to see the glory of God in the Scripture so that our hearts are irresistibly drawn to it so that we trust the One who is revealed in it. You know, it, it doesn't come apart from the Word of God. He makes the, the gospel which is in the Word of God powerful to save, and this is how He does it. But as we saw in our apologetic series, we, we know that this involves a certain process 
The Spirit of God works through various evidences, through various means. And I thought it might be good for us to, remind, to remember that this morning. First of all, that there are different evidences, different proofs, different things that persuaded us, that the Spirit of God used to persuade us that the Bible is the Word of God and, you know, that we need to be able to use for the Spirit to persuade others, okay? Now, the Spirit of God essentially does that by showing us how the Bible of God is unique. By the way, He did this for all of us, at least if we were paying attention, right? First of all, we see the Bible has stood the test of time. The Bible has been around longer than any other book in the world. The Pentateuch was written over 3,400 years ago. You realize that's a long time. And the whole Bible was written over 2,000 or close to 2,000 years ago. No other book has been so carefully preserved. No other book has been the subject of such intense study. No other book has been so criticized by its enemies, and yet it remains the best-selling book of all time. Every year, the Bible outsells every other book. It has the power to search hearts. When you read the Bible, you may think you're coming to it to criticize it. May, well, not as Christians, hopefully. But people do, and they soon find that the book or the Bible is criticizing them. I think you and I understand as Christians that... The insights that the Bible contains are far beyond those of any other book. And even as R.C. said, a lifetime of study would not be enough to learn everything that it has to teach us. It's made up of 66 individual books, some of them written by a common author, many of them not, and yet it speaks with one voice. There's 40 authors who wrote over a period of 1,500 years who come from all different walks of life, and yet, they speak with perfect agreement on what is arguably the most controversial subject in the entire world. Okay, they speak with one voice, even if the church doesn't. Okay? So that unity shows an author that transcends, as it were, the, the, the human authors of the book. It contains the most perfect ethical standard of any writing in history. It predicts the future with amazing detail. Remember over 300 prophecies regarding Jesus, all of which were fulfilled by him, many of them outside of his power, humanly speaking, to do. And we could add to this its historical accuracy and its power to transform lives. Okay, but despite all of this evidence, Calvin believed that we will never be fully convinced that the Bible is the Word of God without the Spirit's ordinary work, okay? We have these proofs that prove really beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, and let's not forget that other argument that R.C. gave to us. And again, I'm doing this to review because we will lose it if we don't review it. That <clears throat> the Bible, is, even if we just take it as basic, reliable history, it records for us several eyewitnesses to the miracles that Jesus did. Those miracles point to Jesus as a messenger sent from God. Jesus, as an authenticated messenger from God, says that the Bible is the Word of God, and that's why we should trust it as the Word of God. Now again, these are objective ways that we believe the Bible is the Word of God, but we will never be fully persuaded unless something happens in our hearts, unless the Spirit of God does this ordinary work. Now, let me just read how the, um, the Westminster Confession of Faith summarizes this whole position. In Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 5, we may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, the many other incomparable excellencies, and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God. Yet, notwithstanding, our full persuasion an assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit 
bearing witness by and with the Word in our hearts. You know, I love the way that Westminster is able to put this so succinctly. In nice short little sentences, you know, I'm kidding. This was one sentence, okay? But it, it reminds us here that without that work of the Holy Spirit, without His removing our natural blindness and giving us a clear view of God's glory in Scripture, we will never embrace what it has to say from the heart. We may tremble like the demons. We may believe what it says is true. But we will never embrace Christ and receive God's mercy in Him and be transformed into His image. That's why the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit is so important because once He does this, we will trust Jesus. We will devote ourselves to Him as our Lord. In other words, we'll receive Him as Savior and Lord. And we will listen to Him as He speaks to us in His Word. And we will obey it. Now again, that's why in Calvin's opinion, the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit is so much more precious than His extraordinary gifts. And why it should be, in our opinion, in our understanding as well. This is where that devotion we see in Luther and Calvin begins, is through the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. Now, next week, we're going to consider how the Lord increases this devotion uh, through the assurance that we really have come to know Him savingly. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us remember what we've seen this morning and uh, most of all to experience what it is that we've been learning about. First of all, that we may see God's glory, love His Word, trust Jesus, and follow Him. Let's, let's pray and also as we prepare to come to His table this morning.